Thank you guys so much for the welcome, Ryan, man. Come on, dude. We just got started, man. I'm, I'm made me tear up on the stage. Brothers and sisters, my name is Pastor Ed, as you heard. Uh, I am from Honduras. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and we've been in Lancaster for nine years now, just about. We're about to be nine years. Uh, allow me for a moment to introduce my family. Uh, with me today, I have my wonderful, most amazing, beautiful wife, Maggie, with me. Would you help me welcome her? I got my two sons, Joseph and Elijah, with me as well. And Libby is somewhere probably tearing up that kid's ministry right now. Sorry, guys. All right. Well, I, I, I do. I'm very excited and overjoyed to be here with you today. If you have your Bibles with you, would you open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll give you a few minutes, to, a few seconds to get there. We don't have minutes. Uh, a few seconds to get there. If you're using your phone, you should be there by now. Because I don't hear no Bibles, no pages flipping these days. So I know how it goes. Do you have that with you? Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Would you stand with me as we read the word together this morning? Because this is not my word. This is not your word. This is God's word. Amen. Uh, and so we're going to honor God today as we take in His Word for us. I believe God is going to speak to us today. He's going to challenge us today. Uh, it is obviously Mission Sunday, and I'll tell you the truth, I, I completely forgot it was Mission Sunday. So it's interesting how God put things together because this is definitely going to speak to that. Um, and so let's read, and then we'll pray, and we'll dive right in. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 17, we're going to go to verse 20. It says, Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing at Live With Purpose, God. It is a wonderful sight to see that this church has life, that this church is being obedient, that this church is walking in faithfulness to what you called them to do. I thank you for Pastor Ryan. I thank you for Joe, Pastor Joe, and for every leader, Lord God, who is stepping up, who's on the in the in the battle with them, who's out in the field, Father, sharing this gospel with everyone. We thank you, Father, for all the laborers here, Lord. And Father, we pray that as we sit under the authority of your word, we ask, Holy. Spirit, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that you would open our eyes to see things we've never seen before. That we may walk empowered by your Spirit, Father, to obey the word you lay before us today. Would you help us to take it in as we worship you, as we look to you, Jesus, and see how awesome and wonderful you are, Father. We open this word, Father, to meet with you. And we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. So there was an article that came out in, uh, recently. Uh, Barna, the Barna Group did a, uh, a study um, regarding millennials and evangelism. And the reason they study millennials is mainly because millennials are one of the largest groups in the workforce right now. Uh, people are really concerned about the future and how things are changing because honestly, millennials, their influence is increasing by the numbers, period. And in this research, look what, he's, look what we find. It says, millennials are unsure about the actual practice of evangelism. Almost half, 47%, agree at least somewhat that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith. Now, consider this. He's talking about Christian millennials here. He's not just telling the average, he's talking about Christian millennials. They can 
They know the answers to some of these questions. They actually know how to engage in conversation, but they actually feel that it's wrong to share those beliefs in hopes that one day someone would change their beliefs. See, sharing the gospel today, he says in the article, is made harder than at any time by an overall culture's resistance to conversation that highlights people's differences. Are you with me? In other words, it's harder to have those kind of conversations where you believe two different things. Because see, not for nothing, our culture doesn't know how to disagree without discrediting one another. In other words, if I disagree with you, I automatically don't need to even rock with you. I don't have to value or validate you. You're an other. You're them in our us, against our us. Are you with me? And three, listen to this, three out of five Christian millennials believe that people today are more likely than in the past to take offense if they share their faith. 65%. That's far higher than among boomer generations, which was 28%. So what does this research actually mean? David Kinnaman, the guy who actually runs the Barna Group, he's the president of it, he says, this study highlights a need for Christians to bolster their confidence... In, the, in certain convictions. Among them, the belief that evangelizing others is good and worthy of our time, energy, and investment. See, I think many of us here would agree that we are supposed to tell others about Jesus. Amen? Amen. We all agree on that, right? Yes? Okay. But I think we would also agree that that's a struggle. That it's not... Easy, it's difficult to share Jesus with another person. And for some, for some, I'll be honest, it's a matter of how, right? How do I start the conversation? How do I share this? How do I talk to people without making them feel awkward and uncomfortable? And Paul's aware of those challenges as he's writing to the Corinthian church. He's very much aware that those challenges are real. Because if you read the rest of chapter 5, you start seeing how he teaches them. He shows them by example. He says certain things that, that show you how he would deliver the message, right? But see, I think at a heart level, there's a greater problem. I think at the heart is, is where the issue really lies. It's a motivation issue. It's, morally, we know this is something God has called us to do. And it's a discipline. It's a spiritual discipline. Just like worship, just like prayer, just like reading your word. But see, we feel far more comfortable in the disciplines of worship, prayer, and reading the word and serving in the church than we do with sharing our faith where we can find resistance, where people will judge us and maybe even reject us. It's a discipline that isn't necessarily comfortable at all. And for that reason, it's one of the last ones we tend to. Are you with me? But nonetheless, we got to ask ourselves, why? Where is, what's lacking in our motivation to get out there and, and, and share this thing? See, I, I think this text shows us that Paul understands this one power of truth, y'all. And I'm going to just lay it out before you right now. The believers need, believers need great conviction to engage in the Great Commission. Amen. Paul knows we need practical teaching. He knows that. And our pastors, our leaders are here to do that for you. We want to give you some practical steps. But at a hard level, Paul is trying to address the beliefs behind the behaviors. Amen. So let me give you a little background as to what's happening in 2 Corinthians. It's obviously 2 Corinthians because it's a sequel. It's the second of two books of Corinthians. And in the first one, Paul starts, and you understand that Paul has been pastoring this church for many years. He's been laboring with them as a pastor for many years. And in this letter, uh, excuse me, in his first letter, he aimed to unify them to one another. Are you with me? First Corinthians, unify them to one another. In this letter, in the second book of Corinthians, Paul is trying to unify them with himself in ministry. Are you with me? Unity's fantastic. That's great. But Paul's like, I don't want you guys to become a bubble within yourself. And get out of the game. I need you to get in this game with me. Because it's not the win isn't our unity. The win is being united in the mission. Amen. Are you with me? And so, so Paul begins chapter 5 by sharing what fuels his own personal uh, uh, pursuit of faithfulness in the ministry. Things like heaven. You hear that in chapter 5. Things like the judgment. The fact that God's going to reward us for the good and the bad that we do. 
The Holy Spirit has also created an urgency, confidence, and boldness in Paul's witness. So when you read chapter 5, if you walk through that chapter, you start hearing Paul's personal beliefs. You see Paul's motivation. You see what moves Paul to get in there, right? But in verse 15, Paul shares how the gospel changes. Excuse me. In verse 15, Paul shares and starts to change the conversation by sharing how the gospel changes how he sees people because of Christ. And, 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 and it's interesting because in verse 15, it kind of looks like Paul's kind of setting up the church of Corinthians to no longer see themselves and others through a human point of view. In essence, Paul is saying that when a person starts to live for Christ, they are no longer ordinary. And they are no longer to see others as ordinary. Every single person you come in contact with every single day is an eternal being. Every single one of them is going to meet God one day. In Christ, you recognize that what we once considered ordinary is no longer ordinary. And now think about this. The Corinthians are hearing this from one of the most extraordinary pastors, apostles to ever walk the earth. Right? It seems as though Paul wants them to understand that in Christ, they are all extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Could you just turn at your neighbor right now? Just tell them you are extraordinary. Because see, here's what happens, guys. Let me, let me be honest with you. Here's what happens to us many times. We hear these stories on Mission Sundays of missionaries that are in Africa, that are in Yemen, that are in Russia, and all these hard countries that are dealing with these hard issues. And you know what happens to us without, without even noticing? You know what happens to us? We start thinking that to get to that level, you need to be a super Christian. That that's for the marine Christian, you know, the, the tough ones who are like all the way in. Like that guy is super Christian. Paul was looked at that way. This is a guy who went and, and got shipwrecked twice, bitten by snakes, beaten up, locked up in jail, and he's still sharing the gospel with people. I mean, this guy, if there was a super Christian, I would call it Paul. Like, that dude is amazing. But Paul is like, no, 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 wait a second. Because of Christ, you can't look at yourself ordinary anymore. Amen. I'm not special. I'm in Christ. That's what Paul is emphasizing. And, and so as we jump in on verse 17, Paul is laying that out. He says, if anyone, somebody say anyone. anyone, anyone, that means anyone in this room, anyone in this planet is in Christ. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So look, notice this, that Paul affirms that anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, not anyone who's in church. Amen. Come on. You see, you can be in church and not be in Christ. So how do we know we're in Christ? How do we know we're in Christ? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's unpack this. Paul is saying here that if anyone is in Christ. See, before we were in Christ, humanity was in Adam. Remember Adam and Eve, Genesis 1, the fall? We inherited not just his sinful nature, but we also inherited his position. Do you remember Adam's final position after the fall? It was separation from God. God could not be around him and not kill him unless there was a sacrifice made for his sin. So his relationship to God, the way the relationship worked, totally changed. That was our position in Adam. Right? Right? But to be in Christ, therefore, would mean that we have a different nature than Adam. It also means we have a different position than Adam. See, because Jesus was sinless and perfect, we now stand in that sinless perfection. When God looks at you, he does not see you as you saw yourself before. He does not see you as he saw Adam. He sees you through the filter of Christ. In other words, your sins are covered. So God can have a relationship with you because the sin you were supposed to die for was already paid for Amen. by Christ. Are we together? Amen. So what does this mean? In Christ, we have a new nature and we have a new position before God. Not perfection. Hear me close. Not perfection. One more time for the back. Not perfection. Right? The reason I say that is because sometimes we think that when God says he has made us the righteousness of God, that suddenly we got to strive for this perfection. No, he is our perfection. Okay? So to have this new nature is to have his perfection. 
You will not be perfect. You will stumble. You will fail. But the dynamic of your relationship is different. Are you with me? For example, if a guy breaks into my house and tries to rob me, a stranger, believe me, I'm grabbing a gun, a knife or something, and, and if my wife doesn't get you first, I'm going to get you, bro. <laughs> right? But if my child goes into my wallet and robs money, will I be disappointed? Will I be grieved? For sure. But I'm not going to hurt him. You see how the relationship changes the dynamic? They were both thieves. But one was my son. Are you with me? So when you, when you fall, when you, when you, when you fail, you've got to understand God does not see you as criminal or stranger. He sees you as son and daughter. So this, this, this newness in Christ, right, means that we get new hearts and new desires that love God and hate sin. If that's something that's real for you, that you've got new desires, you, you love God and you hate sin, I'm here to tell you you're a new creation. If you wasn't sure, let me just lay it out for you. If you hate your sin and love God today, you're a new creation. And Paul uses that word creation intentionally. He uses that word new creation very intentionally. Because see, creation reflects God's omnipotence. It reflects God's life-giving and creative power. And it also points to a similarity between this and Genesis 1. The creation in Genesis 1 tells us what? That God initiated it. So to say that you are a new creation is to say God initiated your change. When you couldn't change for yourself, God started something in you. How many can testify? I wasn't looking for God when he found me. I didn't even know who God was. But he came and he delivered me because he loved me. He came and showed me his life-giving power. See, creation with regard to God is not the same as our creation. See, this right here, we could say, whoever was the artist that did this, which is pretty awesome, by the way, we could say, look at, behold my creation. They could say that, and it wouldn't be a false statement, right? Because they created it. They, but they created it with created substance. Creation for us is very different than creation from God. Because God's the only one who could create something out of nothing. Oh, God, help me in this place. See, you got to understand. See, being in Christ is a supernatural thing. If you are a Christian this morning, if you woke up this morning believing in Jesus, you got to know that's a supernatural thing. And no amount of argumentation will actually bring that kind of change in your heart. Because it's a God-initiated, God-done, creative power. Being a Christian in itself is supernatural. Even if you never saw a person come back from the dead, if you never saw blind eyes open, if you never saw God feed 5,000 people, the fact that you believe in Jesus and want to live for him is a miracle in itself. So when you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself and you're like, man, I look rough. And you say, wow, but that's a miracle. God did something. I am here and alive in Christ because God started something in me. You're not ordinary. So you don't become a Christian. God makes you a Christian. A Christian doesn't merely modify who they are. God creates life where there was death and makes something new out of nothing. See, in our nothingness, we cannot relate to God. In our nothingness, we cannot relate to God. But now in Christ, we can relate differently to God than we did in Adam. Why? Again, because this relation to God that we now have is not bound up in my goodness. It's not bound up in my feelings. It's not bound down in my Bound up in my ability to follow, it's bound up in Christ. See, in light of this, Paul emphatically declares, look, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Translation, you need to stop dragging yesterday to today. You need to stop dragging into today what has already passed away. Oh, man, look, 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 let me, let me, maybe this one was for me. I'm sorry. I'm glad I brought my own praise, y'all, because I'm going to tell you right now. See, here's what happens. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. I was literally on the drive up here, getting ready to preach, right? Pastor Ed, oh, he's a pastor now. He's always on fire. No, that's not true. Because on the way up, all I kept hearing inside was voices reminding me of who I was and giving me reasons why I shouldn't preach this in confidence. How many can say, I wake up in the morning every day like that sometimes. That I need to remind myself who I am in Christ. And and the thing is, look, he's not saying this is a demonic attack. Sometimes it's our very own flesh that's trying to say, hold up, hold up. I know you got a new spirit in you, but that ain't me. You're actually me. You're not that new spirit. You're this flesh. No. 
You got to stop on. You got to understand that this flesh is already judged and dead. According to Romans 6, 6, it is dead. It has been brought to nothing. So therefore, the old has passed away. So wake up every morning, throw a funeral and a party. Amen. Come on, come on. Bless God for that, y'all. Go ahead. You can bless God for that. God in Christ has made for a way for us to walk in newness of life. So please stop looking at your life from a human point of view. What Paul's point is. Stop looking at yourself from a human point of view. You are in Christ. Look at verse 18. Put your eyes on, on the Bible for a second. Look at verse 18. Let's read that together. Look how he words this. In verse 18, he says, all this is from God. All this is from God. He says, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Can we take a moment, just a deep breath, in the reality that all this is from God? Amen. <laughs> you know what I love about that? That this is all about what God has done in you. And it hasn't even told you what you need to do yet. Are, are you with me? See, we sometimes, when, we, when it comes to missions and evangelism and all that stuff, we want the how-to. But, 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 but Paul, I would argue, the Spirit of God wants to give us the why before the what. The why before the how. Are you with me? And so look what he says. He gave Christ to reconcile us. So what does that mean to be reconciled? In the original language, listen to this. The original language, the, in the Greek it says to reestablish proper, friendly, interpersonal relation after these have been disrupted or broken. Sin did that. Sin came in, in that relationship with God. And, and, and it busted everything up. It alienated us from, uh, from God. It cut us off from fellowship with Him. And you see, God hates our sin. And apart from Christ, we are sinners who are hostile towards God. But Jesus came and undid that. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Christ has done it and it can't be undone. Amen. Oh, thank God for that. And now we have restored fellowship, excuse me, with God. We have been given this, all this from God, a gift to be received. And with this gift, he has given us a ministry. <laughs> you know, there was a time, man, do you remember back in the younger years before worship was a thing for us? Do you wondering, God, what's my calling? Where am I? God, what are you calling me to do? And don't get me wrong, I believe in calling. I do. I do believe in calling. But I also see that God has given us a ministry already. He's already given us responsibility. And he's given us this thing called the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? Well, again, I'm glad you asked. Let's explain it this way. I always found online dating kind of weird. Anybody with me on that? Online dating was like a little strange to me at first when I first heard about it. I never really felt comfortable with the idea of meeting someone online, right? I found the whole concept strange, thinking that someone could find a serious, committed relationship through a website or a phone app until I met many married couples. I mean, I was actually astonished how many married couples I met who actually met on those websites. It was weird and awesome at the same time, right? Because they were healthy couples. They were actually in love. You wouldn't think they met by putting their name in a computer, right? When they told their stories, it was interesting, I realized that the website had no real impact on their relationship except connecting them. Let me read to you the mission statement from Match.com, one of the oldest online websites ever. I'm going somewhere, follow me. Their mission statement is to establish a romantic connection. They believe it's a fundamental human need. Whether it's a good date, a meaningful relationship, or an enduring marriage, romantic connectivity lifts the human spirit. Our mission, they say, they say is to increase romantic connectivity worldwide. Match.com isn't responsible for developing the relationships. In fact, the win for them isn't how great the marriage turns out. To them, the win is simply connecting more people with one another. In other words, they're just setting the meeting place. When I hear Paul giving this talk about the ministry of reconciliation, I see God giving Christians the responsibility to just set the meeting place. 
set the meeting place for sinful, broken people to encounter Jesus Christ through the good news of the gospel. Yeah. You're not responsible for how this thing turns out. You're not responsible for how they respond to it. You're just responsible for setting up the date. Amen. That's all you're doing. And if you do that with a couple of cupcakes and you go around the block and you share those cupcakes because cupcakes make people happy and you want to just talk to people and tell them about Jesus, that's fine. You set the date. That is the ministry of reconciliation. You are actually moving in it. And see, our job isn't to make people like Jesus, like, like Jesus, or love Jesus. God does that. Amen. We don't have to figure out the heart transformation. God does the work. Look at the, the other half of verse 19. It says, in Christ, God was making his appeal, right? We don't have to answer for every question, every objection. You know, sometimes I think we think we need to be Ravi Zacharias and know our stuff really, really good. You know, Ravi Zacharias is one of the best apologists ever, right? Like, and, and this guy literally goes and debates in like Muslim mosque. Like he is gifted for this. But we think we need to get to that level before we could really engage in conversation just in case it throws a curveball. No. Your job is just to present Christ. Look at verse 19. It says, God did not give us the responsibility for the relationship, but it says God has entrusted, entrusted. That's a very important word. He's entrusted us the work of setting the meeting place to entrust something to you. Listen, uh, uh, <laughs> yesterday my wife had a, a women's event, right? And, uh, and I, I wasn't going to share this story, but it's just great. Um, my wife had a, a women's event, and so I was volunteering with a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, my other brother-in-law was volunteering with a whole bunch of stuff. And, and our wives were actually at the event serving as well. And we all have a lot of kids together. <laughs> Between the both of us, we have, what, eight kids? Me, me and Will? Eight kids. Yeah, eight kids. And then... My, my, my friend, Stephen, unfortunately wasn't prepared for this, but, but we unfortunately had to, hey, man, could you watch the kids for us? We entrusted our kids with them, right? And, and I mean, i tell you the truth. He knew it was a, a big responsibility, not just because it was a lot of kids, but it was because it was our kids too. We, we entrusted that. And that's what God, God, when he says he's entrusted the ministry of reconciliation, he's saying, yo, treat this with value. Treat this with, with seriousness. Don't, 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 don't play around with this. Don't be lax about it. Because I've entrusted it to you. So what I love about that is that Paul isn't saying this to any special Christian. He's not saying it to the gifted. He's not saying it to the specially called. He's saying it to the whole church in Corinth. In fact, Paul is so serious about this that he gives everyone a brand new title. Ambassadors. Say that with me. Ambassadors. Ambassadors. You are an ambassador for Christ. If you didn't know, now you know. Right? What's an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of one royal court to another. Hear me, church. Well, we represent the kingdom of God before the kingdom of darkness in this world. And Paul explains what he means by ambassador by saying God makes his appeal to a lost and dying world through us. God is trying to reach people through you Amen. all day, every day. With the way you respond at work, with the way you care for people, with the way you show love, he's already begun his appeal. You are a part of God's evidence before a dying world saying, look what I can do if you would surrender. That's what your life is. You are a walking billboard for the kingdom of God. Hear me, this is the beauty of it too. Paul explains that, that being an ambassador, an ambassador says that God makes his appeal. Hear me, God is the true evangelizer, not us. God is the one who makes his appeal through us by means of the gospel. So let me free you up of the pressure. The results are not in our hands, right? We established that. They're in God's hands. Your responsibility is the truth. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it like this. Our primary role in evangelism is to glorify God not save souls. Mm. What? I thought that's what we did this for. To save souls. He said, no, no, your primary role is to make much of God. To glorify God. Make God look as amazing as he actually is. That's your job. God saves souls. Amen. God's the one who saves souls. In reality, evangelism is really take your kid to work day and God has just brought us along for the ride. God is the one who's doing the work. We're just going along with him. 
Look at verse 20, the second half of verse 20. Paul here, I, I, I feel he changes the mood here. And we're going to close in a few seconds. He changes the mood here. Look what he says. He says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Implore is not a light word, y'all. Implore is not a light word. Let me read you the definition of implore. It's to ask for with urgency, with the implication of presumed need. In other words, to implore is to beg someone to come and get what they truly need. If it's like having what someone needs, seeing they're about to suffer for not having it, and shouting, yo, come and get it, I'm here. I mean, you know, this might be a bit of a dramatic uh, example, but I, I think you'll understand the mood when he says implore. Have you ever seen a movie where a person is about to, you know, hurt themselves permanently because they're in the room, right? They're about to kill themselves essentially. And there's another person on the other side of the door saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Please don't do it. That's imploring. That's what imploring looks like. So Paul says, we implore you. And we do this on behalf of Christ. On behalf, listen of who? Of the one who died to forgive sin. But he's also the one who will return to judge the earth for its sin. He pleads, come get what you need most. You know what it's like? You, you know, parents, we got enough parents here. You ever warned your kid, like to the point of, listen, I love you. I'm telling you kindly because I don't want to hurt you. Come on, parents. If you didn't say it, you thought it. It's okay. It's all right. Right? But what I mean by that is, is you don't want to punish them as severely as they may be expecting because of their response. In the same way, Christ is like, listen, I'm going to judge the world for sin. Let me judge it now on the cross before you have to stand before me on your own and answer for yourself. And then I'm not coming as a lamb. I'm coming as a lion. I'm not coming as a friend. I'm coming as a judge, a holy judge who's going to end it if you are not holy. And unholiness that you can't even earn on yourself. I'm telling you, please come to me. Please I already pay for it. This is what Paul saying. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Please don't wait. Don't wait till it's too late. You don't have to be older to get it right. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to be a super Christian and never fail to get it right. You only have to believe in Christ. Amen. You only have to trust him. Yes. Paul is saying we implore you, please. What people need most is not a better life. They don't need more wealth. They don't need more health. Listen, an earthly life, we don't need that with free of problems as much as we want that. And there's nothing wrong with being healthy and having money. There's no problem with any of that. But what people need most is to be reconciled to God. Can you see now what Paul is describing as our motivation for missions? And there are five. I'll give it to you quick and I'll close. The gospel has made us new, number one. That's one of the primary motivations. You have been made new by the very message you're called to give. Amen. Number two, we have been reconciled through Christ and it can't be undone. We are secured in Christ. Yes. We are secure. Even if I mess up, I don't have to think, oh man, I'm too messed up to share the gospel. Yes, you are. Because the same gospel is going to lift you up from your fall. It's the same gospel is going to save a soul. Yes. Amen. So number three, we have been entrusted with his message is not my message. It's his message. Amen. And listen to me. Your testimony is not the gospel. You can share your testimony. Go ahead and share your testimony. But get to the gospel. The gospel is you need to be reconciled to God. You don't just need my testimonial and know how well it went for me. You got to know you need to be in right relationship with God for yourself. Yeah. You need this. Number four, we have been sent to a lost and dying world with the full backing of heaven as ambassadors. Listen to me. As an ambassador, you got to understand you are representing the king as though you were the king. Yes. So when the enemy would attack you, that's an act of war against the sovereign king of kings and lord of lords. And that's what builds that kind of bonus to say, I'm going to go no matter what. Even if it's sketchy, even if it's scary, even if I might die, I will go because if they touch me, they're touching the kingdom. And I know my king's not going to sit back and let you do whatever you want from me because he is sovereign. He is mighty. He is good. He is in control. So I go with confidence that being an ambassador means I got the full backing of heaven. And number five. 
Christ pleads through us to a lost and dying world to be reconciled to God. Listen, don't ever get too saved that you don't get broken over the lost. I hope you understand what I mean by that. Too saved in the sense that you're so comfy in your Christianity that it doesn't bother you that there's people dying without Christ. That tomorrow you're waking up and you're still a Christian and there's still hope for you and there's an eternity waiting for you and have your praise Jesus. But there's somebody who's in the hospital as we speak who doesn't know Christ at this moment and is going to spend eternity apart from him. In hell, guys. Hell's a real thing. Jesus wouldn't implore if it wasn't that serious. That's right. That's right. He wouldn't implore if it wasn't that serious. And I know for some of us are like, wait, but God's a God of love. How is it possible that he would have hell? He's a God of love. Listen, let me explain to you. Let me explain to you, Chris. If I go up right now and I punch a stranger in the face, I would probably get locked up for a couple, a couple of days. If I go, I punch a cop, I'm going to get five to ten years. If I punch the president of the United States, I'm going to jail for life. Do you see that the measure of the authority that you offend, the greater the consequence? Yes. Wow. Can you imagine offending an eternal God who is holy, perfect, and righteous, who gave you the very breath and power to slap him in the face, who upheld your breath as you sinned against him? Wow. Can you imagine sinning against that God? It's not jail. It's an eternity in hell. The gospel is the great conviction to engage in the great commission. Evangelism is not the most popular shout me down topic in the scriptures, but it's definitely the most urgent. Because even on our worst day, the person you didn't share the gospel with actually had a far worse day than we did. Because we have a savior. They don't. And I'm going to close with this quote from Charles Spurgeon. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about our knees, imploring them, please stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertion. And let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Look, as we pray, I don't want you to dwell on missed opportunities. Don't let the enemy condemn you even now. You are a new creation. Amen. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In fact, if you read on in, in, in chapter 6, the very first verse, he says, and working together with him. See, repentance today just means, God, I'm not going to try to evangelize on my own. I'm going to work with you. That's what repentance is. We're going to work with him as God makes his appeal through you. So let's pray this morning that God would help us to work together with him. To make his appeal to others. Would you stand with me? You know, you can't hear Paul implore like that and assume that we just said you could be in church and not be in Christ. I don't know if there's anyone here who's never actually said, Jesus, I will follow you. Jesus, I, I, I need you. You've never actually said that. You've never actually committed your life and saying, Jesus, I need a savior. I need to be reconciled to God. But today, look, Paul even says a few verses after, today's the day of salvation. Amen. This is not one of those things you wait for. This is not like insurance. It's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting heaven now. We're talking about getting Christ now. And we're talking about a security that's eternal. An ongoing, growing relationship. Listen, the win isn't getting to heaven. The win is getting God. Amen. And if you don't have God or don't know God and you know you need God, you need to respond to that inner push, that inner call of the Spirit. Kids, I love you to death, but I remember, I remember vividly my mama telling me in my face, you are not going to heaven because mommy and daddy are going to heaven. There comes a point we have to make a choice also. And we're not going to make it just out of our will. We're going to make it because the Spirit is really moving in us to say, man, I know I want God. If that's you today, man, I'm just going to ask everyone just to bow their heads for a few moments. And we're going to let the Spirit move in the room as He's been doing already. And every eye is already bowed. Every, every eye is already closed. Every head's already bowed. If you want Jesus this morning, would you meet me up here up front and I'll pray for you? I'm imploring you, please don't, don't, don't think 
you know if you're not sure. I implore you, please, be reconciled to God. And I, and I implore you on behalf of Christ. If that's you today, would you just slip your hand up and say, man, I, I want God. I, I want to know him like that.